Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome to Black Race Matter. My name is Tammy Gibson, Sankofa Travel Her, and I'm so excited to have my guest, James R. Morgan III. How are you doing, James, and welcome to Black Race Matter. Uh, well, you know, Tammy, I've been answering that question, how are you doing, the same way for the past year and a half, two years. Uh, when everyone sw- asks me how I'm doing these days, I just tell them I'm Black in America. And I let yeah. that mean whatever it means to them. Exactly. Um, so before we start talking about you, I just want to let people know that I met James like over a decade ago. Um, we went to Egypt. Um, he was a student at Howard and I was a student at Chicago State. Mm-hmm. And that's what, and we went met at the airport. He had on his Mason jacket. I had on my Eastern Star jacket. And I don't know. This was, it was my first time going to Egypt. I don't know if it was your first time going to uh, it was. Egypt, it was. right? So it was an amazing experience. Um, um, James is just so full of knowledge. I follow him all the time. He's just doing amazing work, and um, definitely going to provide all the information to follow him. I want him to talk about his book and what he's doing, but this is someone that you definitely need to follow. So James, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh man. Um, Well, first and foremost, uh, I am a native of New Jersey uh, with my uh, mother's family uh, being very entrenched into the history of Southeastern Alabama and my father's family from uh, Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, I am uh, the oldest of two. I'm a Virgo. Like one walks on the beach. <laughs> uh, right. No, right, right. Uh, no, seriously though, I'm, I'm uh, as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a graduate of, of the illustrious Howard University. Uh, currently, I am enrolled uh, as a uh, graduate student um, at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, where I also uh, work as an assistant um, instructor. Um, and I'm an author uh, of my book, The Lost Empire of Black Freemasonry in the Old West. And I also serve, I'm a Prince Hall Mason and I serve as the Grand Historian and Archivist of the uh, Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am a uh, consultant with the African American Civil War Museum, which is actually where I'm located right now. Uh, the reason why I have the background of my family, of my ancestors, is because if I took it off, you would all see that we're moving into our new space. Uh, and so right now, our, our, our um, normal background with the exhibits and stuff has all been disassembled, and we are in the process of moving. Uh, so if you're ever here in the Washington, D.C. area after uh, August, uh, once September, October rolls around, we should be reopened in our new location. And we're very excited about that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so can you tell us a brief history about the uh, Columbia Harmony Cemetery? Sure. So, we would, so, so I'll, ask, I'll answer that question with a question. Do you want the history that everyone knows? Do you want the history that a lot of people don't know? What a lot of people don't know. Okay. So the history that a lot of people don't know about Columbian Harmony Cemetery is that this is one of the oldest Black cemeteries in Washington, D.C. But it was founded by a particularly special group of men. Um, These men had established an organization before the cemetery itself was formed called the Columbian Harmony Society. Um, which was established in November of 1825. Now, the key to understanding why these men were so special is you actually have to go back a few months earlier in that year to June 6th of 1825. And what happens on that particular day is these men, uh, these men like such as William Custis Costin, John W. Prout, William Jackson, William Wormley, okay, George Bell. These are some very important uh, Black men in in Washington, D.C., uh, most of them are from this area, but some of them from Virginia, Maryland. John W. Prowse from Philadelphia originally. Uh, these men on June 6, 1825, actually receive a charter to establish Social Lodge Number 1, which is the first uh, African-American Masonic Lodge, or, or some, we say Prince Hall, um, Masonic Lodge in the uh, nation's capital, okay? And so what happens is that these brothers form this Masonic Lodge, and then a few months later, they form the Har- Columbian Harmony Society really as their burial arm um, for their organization, uh, for their families, and for the community. Over time, the Columbian Harmony Society grows into um, a burial society for the you know, community at large and becomes one of the most important uh, cemeteries in, in D.C. history, really. Um, 
Uh, they, they housed over, just under 40,000 uh, burials between the years of 1828 uh, and 1960. And uh, unfortunately, that cemetery was displaced um, because of the machinations of some, you know, today we call it urban renewal, gentrification, however you want to call it. Um, but the cemetery was displaced, as happens with a lot of, of, of majority African-American cemeteries. And uh, that's what we're here to talk about today. Okay. So how did you get involved in the project? So I personally got involved with this project because one of my biggest issues as a Masonic historian has been the fact that the fraternity that I belong to um, has played such an integral role in um, African-American history or in American history more, more broadly, um, not just the members themselves, but the organization itself has. Um, and a lot of people have not known that. Um, and so as I always you know, tell, tell um, my students, uh, one of whom was here on this, on this call today, uh, she can tell you that I always say half the battle is showing up. Half, that's half the battle to me in, in, in history and in, 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 in intellectual work is showing up. If you're not there present, to represent yourself, to tell your story, you've already waved the white flag, right? And so for me, that was very important. Um, I got involved with the project because when I learned that um, this group called um, Hassan, uh, the Histo History, Arts and Sciences Action Network um, had been te teamed up with the governments of Virginia, Maryland, and DC uh, to form another group called the Sons and Daughters of Harmony Cemetery. This is a uh, descendant advocacy group, not just literal descendants, but also organizations uh, who were involved with the cemetery. Um, I thought it was you know, necessary that the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of DC um, be involved, seeing as the fact that our oldest lodge, which still, our social lodge still exists. Uh, as a matter of fact, I recently transferred my membership in the social lodge. Um, so, social lodge still exists, and yet, and still very few people are aware of this really, really deep connection uh, between the cemetery and our fraternity. Um, most of our early members and early leaders were buried there, okay? And so the fact that the cemetery was displaced affected me directly as a historian because when I go on Facebook and I look at some of my counterparts in other states, they're able to go and show you pictures and say, hey, this is where our first grand master, our first grand matron, and this one and that one is buried. And being the historian of DC, I can't do that. And so what I did was I just reached out, sent an email, and said, hey, you know, I'm the grand historian from D.C. Uh, for the Masons. Uh, you know, is there anything we can do? What can we do? Um, what's needed? And the response I got back was really surprising to me. Um, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Lex Musta, um, who works with, with, with Hassan, um, contacted me and said, hey, we wanted to contact you all anyway. Um, because, as, as I said, there were about 37,000 headstones that uh, have been identified that were displaced by the cemetery. And when I say displaced, I mean, they were sold and used for, for, for rubble, for filler, um, and, and used down the Potomac River uh, near, near Caledon State Park on the home, or at the plantation home, which is, is now the home of Senator, I believe it's Richard Stewart um, of the state of Virginia. Um, and that's his ancestral home, which his family had sold off and he purchased back years later. Um, so out of that 37,000 stones, 55 of them had been recovered at, at, this, at this point where, where, where we're speaking. And um, the email said that, hey, you know, out of those 55 stones, the tallest one that they had retrieved from the water was one of a mason. And um, I, believe we have the, I believe you have the picture uh, that we'll show. Um, but when I saw that picture and I saw the, uh, the Masonic emblem, the square and compass, which I have here on my ring, um, it, it literally sent a shiver to my body because I said, well, wait a minute, this is a Masonic brother. And as further research would indicate, uh, this brother was not only a member of my Grand Lodge, uh, he was also a member, he was also a Grand Lodge officer, um, like I, as I am. And so, you know, it, we have this concept of fraternal organizations um, in Masonry, Eastern Stars, and I'm sure the Greek fraternities and sororities have something similar of this concept of being of seeing a brother or a sister in distress and what do you do about it right and so for me um as a historian i often think about not only people alive today what are we doing to help those alive today but what are we doing to prepare for those who are yet to come and those who've already gone before us see the most neglected members of our community a lot a lot of times are the deceased 
we don't, a lot of times we think we don't think of them as members of our community, but they are, but they are. And so um, what I did was I contacted my grandmaster, who at the time was uh, was most worshipful grandmaster, uh, Quincy Gant, who's no longer in office now. But um, I contacted him and said, hey, grandmaster, look, we got to do something. I explained to him the situation. I said, we have to do something. And so he gave me permission to form a committee to uh, investigate and see what we could do um, to offer some support uh, to this project. And I was very glad to, uh, to have been a part of that and to have been able to help lead that team. Um, along with uh, sister, I can't leave out sister Catrice Vandross from the, uh, the sister's uh, side of the fence, if you will, because she was very integral as well um, in, in helping with that initiative. So I'm going to show the um, slideshow, but before I do, what was your reaction? How did you feel when you saw um, those headstones for the first time? What emotions did you have? What, how did you feel? Heartbroken. Mm -hmm. I was heartbroken because if you, as, as we, we're taught in masonry, um, I think we all should be taught you know, in life, death is a great equalizer, right? So, so, so there's that scene, I believe it's in, is it, Ham yeah, I believe it's Hamlet, right? You know, everybody talks, you know, we, we talk about to be and not to be and all this type of stuff, right? But when you really go back and look at in, in that play, for those who've, who've Shakespeare out here, right? Um, there's the, the, the famous graveyard scene, right? Where Hamlet is basically looking at the, the skulls of all his ancestors. And then he sees the skull of this man who was basically like a, a jester um, for when he was a baby. He says, you know, hey, look, I knew this man. But right now I'm looking at his skull I'm looking at the skull of all my royal ancestors and I can't tell the difference. Same thing happened with me when I saw these, these stones. Um, these were stones of men, women. Uh, they were stones of children as well. Um, and guess what? All the stones were not of black people either. They were at, what, what, one of the things that we found out when these stones started being removed is that you have a significant population of Asian, um, I believe Chinese uh, uh, immigrants uh, who are buried there. You have some Jewish, European Jews being buried in this place, right? So it's not just a Black thing either. This is a, it, it, on a human level, to know this would happen to anybody. And, you know, and I'm sure there were people who were buried there who I would have had disagreements with or what have you. But the fact that they would, would that their graves would be treated like that, it was, it was heartbreaking um, to know that this was allowed to have happened. Um, but I was encouraged because we were there now on the scene to do something about it. Um, Hassan was already doing that work. Um, and I was glad that the, that, that the Prince Hall Grand Lodge in DC was stepping up to the plate to, to assist as well. Okay. So we're about to bring up the, um... uh, can everybody see it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Okay, so what, so what you're seeing here is a, is a basic map of what, uh, of where Harmony Cemetery um, was, um, and I would still say is, and we're gonna get to why the is in one, one moment. Um, so if, for those who are not familiar with Washington, D.C., um, every state in the union has a street represent, you know, rep representation here in, in the city. And so you're looking at Rhode Island Avenue, I don't know if anyone can see my mouse, um, but you're looking at Rhode Island Avenue is like the main street coming from the top right corner um, down diagonally, right? Now, that green area where you see Harmony Cemetery is located um, during this period uh, when it was established, it's established in a location that is bounded by railroad, which in, in industrial areas, which is very important to the story, okay? Now, before we get to that, let's understand something. The areas surrounding Harmony Cemetery, that we see this red, the, the outlying neighborhoods, over time, what occurs is um, restrictive covenants are put in place around the cemetery, stating that no person or organization of Negroes, as they like to call us, uh, would be able to buy property in or around that area. But Harmony Cemetery was there previously, so they couldn't affect that, okay? So what you're seeing is you have a, a, a cemetery that, is, that has been cut off, I would say strategically from the rest of the black community, legally on paper, this is what, what, what is being stated, okay? Over time, um, one of the big issues that the cemetery runs into 
is they try to seek um, tax a tax exempt status. And what the city does is the city says, okay, for the lands that you currently are using for burial, no problem. But for the lands that are not currently occupied by burials, those lands will be taxed, which of course spells um, big problems for the finances of the Harmony Cemetery slash the Columbian Harmony Society, which is which is managing um, this this area. Now, I want to be very clear with you all for a second. Um, on a personal note, this is not some far off land for me uh, personally. Uh, I'm not I, as I said. I'm from New Jersey originally, but I live here in, in the DC area. Uh, Rhode Island Avenue is a main street as a main avenue in and out of the city. Matter of fact, when I get off this Zoom call, I'm going to go home and guess what street I'm going to go on? Rhode Island Avenue, past what was once Harmony Cemetery. Now you may be wondering, I said the cemetery was was displaced. Well, what was it replaced with? Well, remember how I mentioned the train tracks that are there? Initially, there were plans to actually um, build uh, build freeway, highway through the area. The, the community uh, you know, basically rebelled and said, no, we don't want that. So what they decided to do instead was they built a metro station, the, the subway system that is for DC. And so right now today, the Rhode Island Avenue Brentwood Metro Station is there where the Harmony Cemetery was. And um, that train line that you see there, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but that train line you can see on the uh, southwestern aspect of the cemetery, that basically follows the route of the tra how the train still is today. Um, but there is a station there. And what's really on top of kind of what like the, the meat of the cemetery right now. Um, you have a, a um, housing uh, condos, um, you have a Home Depot and a strip mall and a parking lot and an adjoining parking lot. There's also a, uh, some other shops, restaurants, there's a DMV there, right? Um, and what has been found over time is just about every time that they have um, done construction there, um, trying to repair the streets or anything, they find human remains, caskets, I mean, just diff different different uh, things. And mind you, money was set aside. They were supposed to, those bodies were supposed to have been removed to a new location, which is uh, out in, in Maryland, uh, where the current, current Harmony Cemetery location is. Um, however, that, that was a botched job and there was very little oversight. And uh, frankly speaking, the people who were responsible, I don't think they, they, they really cared. They wanted the land, uh, which was purchased for, um, a few hundred thousand dollars, but then it was sold to the city of, of Washington for about three and a half million. So, so somebody made a profit off of this and didn't even move the bodies correctly, but made a significant profit. So this gentleman here is William Custis Costin. Uh, he's one of my favorite individuals to talk about in DC history, a very, very uh, unique individual. Um, his name alone might evoke some 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 uh, questions in your mind because I was very careful to say William Custis Costin. Now, for, for those who are not familiar, matter of fact, I'll ask you, Tammy. When I say the na that that name, what th does anything come to your mind? Um, James Madison. You said James Madison. No, but you're getting but you're getting close though. Wait a minute, close. Washington. That's right, George okay. Washington. Okay, I knew it right. Because George George Washington was the second husband of Martha Dandridge Custis who we know, history remembers her as Martha Custis Washington, but in fact, she was Martha Dandridge. Then her first husband was a Custis who, who died and preceded her in death. Then she married General Washington, okay? Now, William Custis Costin's story is very interesting because according to, um, to history and to, to family tradition, uh, Martha Washington, the first, first lady of the United States of America, had an enslaved half-sister named Anne Dandridge. Um, Anne Dandridge was um, apparently sex, she was a sexually, assault, sexually assaulted by Jackie Custis. Now that's Martha's son from her first marriage, okay? Uh, George Washington's stepson um, a, a, apparently sexually assaulted her. And from that situation, William Custis Costin was conceived and born uh, in or around Mount Vernon Plantation. Um, he ends up leaving um, around 1804. Uh, as most of the other enslaved folks there did. Um, and he comes here to Washington, D.C. and becomes a, uh, an educator. He actually opens up, he helps his daughter open up a school out of his own home, uh, which later gets set up as its own building on A Street Southeast. Um, he works as a clerk 
and a messenger at the Bank of Washington. He's also an abolitionist as well. He, in 1821, fights a very famous legal case where he fights against the D.C. Black Codes, which basically these codes were putting in laws to say that free Black people could not do certain things that, that they had already been doing. So, for example, they, they, they tried to put in a curfew that said that free Negroes could not be outside after 10 p.m. They had to have a bond um, with two or three good, uh, re- with two or three white people of good re- reputation who would vouch for them that they would behave themselves. Um, William Costin fights this in court. Um, he goes before Judge William Cranch, and Judge Cranch actually um, partially uh, cancels the law. He actually says that any free Negro who could prove that they were free and in the city before this date, that they would be immune from the law. So they'd be grandfathered in. Well, it's very curious. William Costin happens to be friends with a man named John W. Prout. John W. Prout had an entire operation where what he was doing was falsifying manumission documents. Okay. Interestingly enough, John W. Prout is the first Prince Hall Mason in Washington, D.C.'s history. One of the first people he recruits to join the fraternity is William Custis Costin. Both of these men, active Prince Hall Mason. Um, and as, as history shows us, so was William Cranch was also, the judge was also a Mason. So it's kind of curious how that worked out. Uh, these men are the same men who formed the Columbian Harmony Society, okay? Uh, William Costa is the only founding member of Social Lodge and of the Columbian Harmony Society, I believe, that we have an image of, at least that I'm aware of um, today. He actually served as the, vice pre- as the very first vice president of, um, of, of the Columbian Harmony Society. So he's there at the founding of this burial society, um, as well as the founding of Prince Hall Masonry here in the District of Columbia. And he's also the father of, uh, and we don't, I don't think I sent this to you, Tammy, but, but he also is the father of our second grandmaster, John T. Costin, okay? Um, in the 1880s, John T. Costin's daughter, Harriet, I believe it was in 1888, if I'm not mistaken, um, John T. Costin's daughter, Harriet, which would be William Costin's granddaughter, she dies and is buried at Harmony Cemetery. And by the 1880s, they have a real problem with, um, with white adolescents breaking into the cemetery and taking the bodies out of, of, of new, new burials, digging them up, taking them out and just leaving them on the streets, setting them up at, you know, uh, at train stations, so just because just just they thought it was funny. And that happens to Harriet Costin, which was William Costin's granddaughter, um, actually. And we were able to document that story as well. So this, this is an image of what Harmony Cemetery looked like. Uh, I believe this was taken in the uh, late 50s or right around 1960. This is how the cemetery looked um, right before the um, exhumations were supposed to have taken place. Those headstones that you see there uh, sit, you know, sitting upright are the very same headstones that were taken down and thrown in the water. Um, these are the last burials, or we thought were the last burial places for these 37,000 people. Um, but those, these headstones, many of them now are, are still on the shoreline or under the water um, down the Potomac River, down near, right next to Caledon State Park. And here, here you can see the, um, I, keep wanting, I want to say the carriage house, not the carriage house, but you see the, um, the, the caretakers uh, uh, facility and whatnot, uh, where they had offices and whatnot. I believe, and I'm not mistaken, this is actually like the front entrance to the cemetery. Um, and to this day, we're, we're harming cemeteries just on a hill. Uh, to this day. And you can also see the construction equipment here as well coming in. Um, this uh, view right here is actually not too far off from where the um, train station is now. I, might, I can tell that because some of those buildings over there are still kind of the same uh, to some degree. And this one here actually is one of the most, um, for me, I don't know why, more so than the others. But to me, this one right here is, is really one of the most impactful for me um, because you can see uh, the tombs and the headstones there. And it just, to me, it just continues to illustrate, you know, who were these people, right? Most of these people were African-American, but many of them were not. Um, you know, somebody spent some real money and in, in, in some real care, whether it was in their personal estate or for their loved one, their grandparent or whoever, um, to make sure they had a decent interment. And so when you see uh, the, these, these tombs here for these people, 
Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't know. You know, maybe someone can magnify it really big. I don't know who exactly these people were, but I mean, you had some of the most prominent African Americans of DC history were buried at the cemetery, as well as some ones who we probably would never have known of anyway. But either way, they were all important. Um, they were all human beings, and um, to, again, just to know that they were treated in such a dis disrespectful way um, re really, really was disgusting and, and heartbreaking for me um, to see. And here we have an aerial view. So you can kind of, so again, if you go back and you look at the map that was the illustration, you can kind of see what, what we're talking about here uh, as far as how Harmony Cemetery uh, kind of kind of flows. You can see, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that's Rhode Island Avenue. Uh, down here on the bottom aspect of this um, of this of this photograph here, but you, you can get a sense of the scale of it. And right now, like as I said, there's a Home Depot, there's you know there's a parking lot, um, and the train stations and, and the shopping center there. Um, that's that what has happened. But you but just think about for a second that you're talking about a project that was really started in 1825, and the first burial ground was established in 1828, if I'm not mistaken. And then later on, it was moved to this location. I mean, these, these are these are people who, many of whom were born into slavery, but they were thinking about, well, what's going to happen to my body when I'm gone? Who's going to remember me? Who's going to remember my neighbor, right? Well, I don't have a whole lot of money, but let's put our, you know, 50 cents, a dollar, whatever. Let's put it all together and see what we can get. I heard some, there's somebody selling some land over here. Um, so they still had vision and foresight for generations to come. And unfortunately, um, because of, um, there was some mismanagement, but a lot of it was also uh, because of uh, government um, and private sector um, attacks. Uh, the cemetery um, was was decimated. So here you can see some gentlemen pulling actual stone uh, one of one of the stones out of the water. Uh, these are uh, these are gentlemen working with Hassan um, and whatnot, and, and they're doing yeoman's work, literally getting into the water, right? Um, and I can tell you, having been down there, this is this area is not convenient. This is not like an area you can go do a couple hours of work and then go down the street and get a Starbucks. Like th this is near a state park in a rural community down in, in central southern Virginia. Um, it took me, I think, about two or three hours to drive there from where I live. Um, but it um, to, to me is worth it to me. To me, it's worth it. It's hard work, but to me, it's worth it. And I'm glad to have been able to say I've been a part of some of it. Not even say all of it, but, but at least I've had been a piece of it is, is phenomenal. Yeah, this is a powerful picture. I have a question to ask. Um, I sure. was at the National Harmony Cemetery a couple of years ago. This is before I knew about, before this, you know, the um, everything happened. Um, mm -hmm. And I went to the gravesite of Elizabeth Keckley. And mm -hmm. they did tell me that her body was moved. They didn't say anything else about it. And mm -hmm. then when this happened, I thought to myself, is she really, is that where she's buried at? Or they just put a headstone there. Right. Right. And and that and that's the thing. See, the truth, the, the truth be told, for most of those people, we really don't know. There were bodies that were moved and dumped into a mass grave as which 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 you would have visited. But um, truth be told, we really don't know. I mean, they weren't cataloged properly. They weren't, I mean, in in the in the, the thing that I've learned that I think is probably the next aspect of research for me um and i know we have a, a, a at least one gentleman here who can probably speak this better than i can even when this was going on the black community was observing and fighting back matter of fact um i um contacted i was contacted by one of the uh members of our of our grand lodge uh, brother nolan chase and he told me he said well yeah when he said they people already knew they were going to do a bunch of job back when they were doing it his grandmother went to went up there with a shovel dug up the the uh the, the stone because she had like one of those uh like those kind of inset stones into the ground his grandmother dug up the stone for her father and took it home and it's sitting right now on the front lawn of their house so it's not that people just kind of let you know like, like the black community was asleep on this even back then people were standing up and saying wait a minute something's not right here you know this is this is this is not correct um and, and it's unfortunate that it went the way that it did and that there, you know, had had we had the internet, had we had Twitter, had we had back then, things may have been a little different. But unfortunately, this is what what what, what occurred. So this is uh, the image. Of, if you're here, I'm sure you've seen this image on the on the flyer. Uh, this is the image of me 
um, sitting with that stone, with that capstone that, that kind of inspired me to get to get active with this project. Um, now, the stone itself actually belongs to um, a brother in our Grand Lodge by the name of Robert Williams. He was a member of um, Eureka Lodge Number no. 5, a past master of that lodge, meaning that he had once been the presiding um, officer there. Um, as I mentioned, you know, it wasn't, I mean, I, I look at historical stuff all the time, um, historic Masonic stuff all the time. Um, this one was, was, was very personal for me. Um, you know, one thing that I would say that I take great pride in um, being a member of the Grand Lodge of DC is that we tend to be very protective of our own. And so the idea that this happened to people that we have lodges, we have lodges named after some of the people, particularly uh, John F. Cook, who I probably should have sent you a picture of him. Uh, John F. Cook, who was um, our longest serving Grand Master, his father was one of the founding members of the Columbia Harmony Society. John F. Cook Jr., who was the Grand Master, he became the president of the society and, uh, or, or excuse me, the, uh, the head of the board of trustees. And he was the manager of the, of the cemetery in the late 1800s. Okay, we have a lodge named after this man. And yet, and still, his body, his headstone, we don't know what happened. You know, you look at Charles Datcher, our first grandmaster, right? All these other brothers and sisters prominent in, in the history of Black Washington, D.C., we don't know what happened to them. Robert Williams wasn't oh, the most God. prominent person. Oh, no, that's no, okay. Robert Williams wasn't the most prominent. He was not necessarily the most prominent person, but should, but does it, should it matter if he was or wasn't? That, that was the thing for me, you know, and so uh, this image here, you can see uh, in the center there, that's Grandmaster Gant, uh, along with uh, our Grand Lecturer, uh, Steve McKenzie and myself, and some other brothers, um, you know, performing a rededication ceremony. We thought that that would be a, a good way, uh, symbolically, um, for us to um, bring attention and awareness to this, um, to this project, um, you know, and, and we actually um, performed a... Um, a, a little bit of a ritual there um, to honor the folks there. We laid a wreath. Um, and um, one of the things that was said at the beginning of it was that um, uh, in masonry, we learn of the importance of cornerstones, which are laid at the beginning of the work, I meaning the, the construction of a building, you lay a cornerstone. And so it also we learn that in the beginning of our lives, our cornerstones are set. We learn how to walk and how to talk and how to read and how to write, how to make friends and how to, you know, deal with bullies and all that type of stuff, right? And, and as we go through life, we eventually get to the point where we're called home, where we, we leave this earthly realm and we, uh, you know, we, we go on to the after, you know, get to the hereafter, if you will. And our capstones are set, meaning that's it. There's no more in this material world, right? And so this capstone um, symbolically represented for us all of the headstones and, and capstones that were uh, laid at this uh, cemetery. And we wanted to recognize the fact that as Brother Williams went, so too would we be going. And so we had brothers and sisters out there that day. We got some food together. And um, and really it turned into, I mean, especially given this COVID environment, um, our Grand Lodge particularly was not, we, we really weren't doing a lot physically during during this pandemic. So this really turned into almost a, a almost a cookout, if you will. Um, but it was one where, where our ancestors, our Masonic ancestors were, were present or, the, or represented um, via, via some of their headstones. And, and we wanted them to know um, that we were there um, thinking of them. We, we know in, the, uh, in, in African culture, libation is important, feeding your ancestors, giving them uh, something to eat and to drink and something to read, what have you is important in, in many um, West African cultures. And so in some way we kind of did that that day and I was very glad to have been one of the people to help put that together. So this is a photograph of uh, Grandmaster Gant with uh, those who participated in the actual ceremony. There is video of the ceremony as well, uh, which I'm happy to share if anyone would like to see. It's about 10 minutes um, as well. But um, even watching those 10 minutes, I think you'll get a glimpse of the um, seriousness that we took with it, but also I think that um, you, you, you'll understand how important this was to each and everyone there. Um, because again, I mean, if you look to Grandmaster Gantz, to, 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 to my right, right? Okay, so the, the brother with the, uh, the blue apron on the stand next to him, that is um, Worshipful Master Daryl Green, 
who is the current master of Eureka Lodge Number 5, the same lodge that Brother Williams was a part of. Stead Lodge still exists. Those Lodge brothers, they showed up. They came out. You know, John F. Cook Lodge, um, those brothers know John F. Cook was really intrinsic into the history of the cemetery. They showed up and came out, okay? And several other folks did. Even people whose lodge, like my lodge, my lodge came along way later than, uh, well, actually, no, my lodge was in 1916, so um, my lodge was around, but we weren't as connected to this history, but brothers still showed up and came out, sisters showed up and came out because we understood that this was our history as an organization. And for those who have family history here, who were born in the DC area, many of them, you know, many people to, even now still come to me telling me, hey, Brother Morgan, you know, that was, that was a good thing you did, but let me tell you about my great grandfather. Let me tell you about my great grandmother. They were buried there. We don't know. If you ever hear anything, let me know. So, so this is an ongoing project and it was one that's very personal, I think, to everyone who participated. And this is a this is uh, everybody who uh, uh, just about everybody who showed up that day. We had we had a few more folks. Um, we also got our um, our USCT involved uh, through through uh, our affiliation with the African American Civil War Museum. I, I love the fact that our Grand Lodge and the uh, the museum are literally across the street from each other, um, and so we were, we were able to kind of bridge that gap a little bit. And some of the brothers uh, dressed up and uh, came out and did and did a presentation of colors for us as well because. Uh, of course, we know that our stories are not monolithic uh, and many people are multifaceted. So we have many people who are buried there who are members of the Masonic Order or the Oddfellows, the Elks, the Eastern Stars, the Daughters of Ruth. Uh, we also have many people who were United States Colored Troops. We have many people who were um, enslaved, many people who were legally emancipated, many people born free, many people self-emancipated. We know we have people who barely ever left the Eastern Shore of Maryland or D.C., we have some people who were buried there who traveled the world. And so we wanted to represent uh, as, in, as, as much as possible our appreciation for the fullness of the humanity of those people uh, who were buried there, uh, those, those men and women, those, those mothers and fathers uh, that were buried there that many others have forgotten. But as we learned, uh, particularly in, in a certain Masonic degree, we learned that the, uh, the stone that the builder rejected has now become the chief stone of the corner. And so... Uh, so too, as it said there, so too would it be with Harmony Cemetery that it's going to be, and I think it should always be a, uh, a cornerstone of our historical memory uh, here in the nation's capital for Black America. Um, is this particular site, is, is it open to the public? Yes. So the site where, where this photograph was taken, this is actually at Caledon State Park, so it's an actual national park. Um, another side note about this park, uh, right in, down the street is where uh, Senator Stewart's um, family uh, plantation home is. Uh, John Wilkes Booth actually passed through this area, believe it or not, when he was trying to escape from his assassination of President Lincoln. And um, what happened was that he actually tried to seek shelter, I believe it was with Senator Stewart's ancestors or maybe their neighbors, um, but he tried to seek shelter with some of them and they rejected him. And so what happened was that later on, he wrote them a letter basically belittling them saying how they how disgusted he was that they were southerners and they were virginians and they would and that they had rejected him that they wouldn't help him later on when the federal authorities came to the area and they arrested these people and said hey john wilkes booth came to you you know you're under arrest for treason you ass assisted him they were able to, to actually prove their um innocence because they had these letters where, where, booth, where booth was saying that they didn't help him help them. So that's just kind of an interesting side note. But to answer your question, um, the, the, the park, state park is open. Um, much of the, um, the where the headstones are is actually on Senator Stewart's property. So you can't really go there without his or his wife's permission or what have you. Um, the stones that are here on this, in this photo are actually on the front end of the park. So it's like right, there's like a, like the street and you can just kind of drive up. Um, but, but these stones here, um, I believe now have actually been re relocated to their proper place in Maryland. Um, and I'm actually going up there tomorrow, tomorrow morning as well. Um, but these, these stones here have been relocated uh, now, thanks to uh, monies that were raised from the uh, governments and other entities. And I'm glad to say the Prince Hall Grand Lodge, uh, we also have supported uh, those efforts as well. Okay, because I, I do plan on going, I will be in that area sometime next month. So I was just wondering if it was open to um, well, 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 when you come there, we'll, 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 we'll talk. We can definitely work that out. We can also save gas. We don't have to go down to all the way to Virginia to, right. unless you really, unless you really want to. 
Um, but we can go to the locate. We can go to um, Harmony Cemetery up here in Maryland and um, and see those stones. But the water, the stones that are still in the water, we'd have to. That's that'd be a, it'd be a good two and a half, three hour trip, which we can do. It's not saying we can't do it, but right. Trip. Okay. Well, so what's next um, for the um, Columbian Harmony Project? What are the what is what's next? So there, there's a number of things that are going on um, right now. Um, there is. Um, we actually look, they're actually looking at establishing um, a memorial there in Virginia uh, near the Caledon Park, as well as at the uh, current cemetery site. I believe there's one or two acres that have been set aside to kind of establish a memorial, uh, a memorial trail. Um, and I'm on a task force uh, for that. Um, there's also, uh, there's been some, some more discussions about documentary, about documentary being done um, and, and a number of other things. That, that, that are going on right now. Um, and so I would encourage anyone who is interested um, to learn more about how they can get involved to visit, I believe it's Project Harmony, projectharmonycemetery.com um, and get on the mailing list, get involved, especially if you have a story um, that you would like to share. And I'm putting that, that link in the chat. Um, if, you, if there's anything that you'd like to share, if you have any information, if you're looking for somebody, um, please by all means get involved, get active. Um, this is a story that I think um, is one that is representative, unf unfortunately, of many other cemeteries throughout the country. And we know that Black cemeteries are in danger. They have been for quite, a, for quite some time for a number of reasons. But the only way that we can change things by, is by getting involved. As I said earlier, half the battle is showing up. Our ancestors showed up for us, so let's make sure we show up for them. Absolutely. I mean, it's very important that um, our ancestors rest in peace and dignity. And, uh, you know, I've traveled all over the world and I've seen a lot of, you know, I could write a book about some of the, the things I've seen at cemetery, African-American cemeteries. And um, that's why I want to use this platform. You know, I always ask people, do you know, um, have you checked on your ancestors lately? You know, that's very important mm -hmm. that, that we need to do. And um, talking to people like you that um, are on a mission um, to preserve these sacred grounds because it's, you know, Black graves do matter. Yes, absolutely. And so if you want to please talk about your book. Oh, man. Well, uh, so the name of my book is The Lost Empire, Black Freemasonry in the Old West, 1867-1906, as you have it there. Um, funny enough, as a side note, uh, there's actually a picture, I actually have a picture in there standing next to some graves. So I guess, I guess I'm a I'm becoming like the, uh, the the undertaker or somebody. I don't know what they're going to call me. But, but in any event, um, yeah, this is a history of how uh, African-American masonry uh, got to what we call the Old West. Uh, it starts out in Kansas with the gentleman that you see there on the cover, Captain William Matthews. Uh, he was the most brutinous, tootinous, gun totinist, uh, somebody that ever walked west of the Mississippi as far as uh, Prince Hall masonry is concerned. And uh, it was a real joy to, to, to be able to write this book. Um, I learned a lot of the, I learned that a lot of the history that had been published was actually incorrect. And there's a reason why, um, several reasons in fact, but I was able to uncover the real history and, and to, to learn that it was a lot more colorful, a little, little more violent <laughs> than uh, the people would, would, would often think about. But you have to remember this was the wild west. And I think it's a good story, regardless of the fact that I wrote it, regardless of the fact that Masonry is involved in it. It's a it's a good story about Black life in the Wild West, and I hope to check it out. And uh, if you if you go on to uh, there you see JamesRMorgan.com. If you go on there, uh, you can also get a signed copy as well if you're interested. Yeah, so if I ever see you, I'm gonna have to make sure I bring my book so you can sign it. Um, but I Absolutely. want to congratulate you on the awards that you won for your book. That's 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 pretty amazing. That's awesome. Bless you. Bless you. Same, same to you. I, I, I look, look. I, as you know, I just got back from California, and before I flew out there, I made sure to ch I, I checked my guide. Let me go ahead and make sure I let me check, see what's out there I need to go look at. So, 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 and so, I, I definitely encourage folks to check, to check your work out too, and support, and support you and all that you're doing. Yeah. Well, James, thank you so much for um, you know spending your time um, talking about you know the history of the of the cemetery. Like I said, I follow you. You do an amazing work. I'm really oh, thank proud you. of you. Um, please make sure you follow him. I mean, he's doing doing such amazing work um, on social media. And if you want to purchase his book, jamesrmorgan.com. Does any of the guests have any questions? Good afternoon, Tammy um, and Jane. Um, my name is Andre. And just have a quick question concerning, I guess, some of the other Black cemeteries in the district that were mm -hmm. displaced. 
So I know that pain um, was displaced and also moved to harmony. Mm -hmm. um, Graceland also has a history of um, displacement. Woodlawn has survived barely. Um, yeah. so is Hassan or any other groups looking at some of those histories and stories um, to understand more about those who were placed there? You know what? I'm glad you asked that question because um, it, gives, it, it gives me an opportunity to say something that I haven't said yet. Um, so when I first came to Grandmaster, decided I was going to go to Grandmaster Gantt with this um, project, um, one of my concerns, in fact, was would it seem like overkill in a way? And the reason why, why I say that is because our Grand Lodge has a longstanding history with Woodlawn Cemetery as well not only with the history, but also with preserving it and doing cleanups and stuff like that with that cemetery. Um, and we actually had just reestablished that. I think there was a break for a little bit there, but we had just reestablished that um, a few years ago. And so my concern was, would, would I be rejected? Because they would say, well, wait a minute, we already doing something with Woodlawn Cemetery. Now you want to go to another cemetery? But, and that really wasn't, the Woodlawn project really wasn't necessarily, like I participate, but it wasn't necessarily my idea per se, but it's something that we've been doing. So I was concerned that when I came and said, hey, let's not forget Harmony Cemetery, that there would be some resistance um, from my leadership. But in fact, they were very open, uh, as I said. Um, and so, so I can answer yes in regards to Woodlawn. But we've kind of reestablished our relationships and, and been maintaining relationships with both Woodlawn and Harmony. Um, as far as Payne and, um, and any other ones go, um, I can't speak to that at the moment, but I would definitely be... Um, be open to kind of creating a dialogue and trying to see and, and talking with Hassan and seeing, you know, what, 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 what's needed, what could be done. But as far as Woodlawn and Harmony go, and as far as the Prince, Prince Hall uh, Grand Lodge go, uh, I can say that we've been working on those um, over the past few years now, and I'm thankful. Um, and maybe there's more we can be doing, but right now that's what we're, that's where we're at right now. Great. Thank you so much. And, 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 matter, and matter of fact, I'll say this to you, since I know you're not too far away, uh, uh, Andre, uh, when we do our community cleanup um, for Woodlawn, um, I'm definitely going to make sure I reach out to you and, you know, and hopefully we can get you to come down and help out. Please do. I've actually have visited that cemetery and so I know exactly where it is. Sounds good. When is the um, cleanup? How many, uh, is it like, um, how many Saturdays? Is it once a month or? Um, we usually do, we usually do, uh, do it annually and I believe it's usually in September. Okay. Um, we usually do, do do so. Um, and actually, there's a video um, when we first started back doing it again, um, where I uh, said some words about um, about Blanche Bruce. Um, there's a video that I have of that um, with everybody around and whatnot. But there's uh, there's a whole history in and of itself of that cemetery, Masonic and non. Um, and one thing I will, another thing I will say too, I have to give a shout out to the, um, the women of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority um, Incorporated, because I know that I believe it's one or two of their founders, I think it's just one of them, that was actually placed at Harmony, whose, whose remains have been displaced. And, and I know they stepped up um, in a major way um, as well um, to help in these, in, with, with both of these projects, both Woodlawn and with, Harm and with Harmony um, as well. So, um, you know, again, you know, if, if you're in this area or if you're part of some of these BGLOs or, what have you, you know, hey, have you checked on your ancestors lately? And that's not just DC, that's everywhere. Have you checked on your ancestors? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so any more questions before we close? Okay, well, I would like to thank you all. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, This has been recorded. I know a lot of people were at work and it was like, I want to watch it, but I'm at work, I don't want to lose my job. So mm -hmm. it's gonna be recorded. And um, um, James, I can send you the link um, so people that were not able to attend, um, they can watch it. And also, I will be interviewing um, Fannie Mae um, on March 31st. And um, we're going to be talking to her about a cemetery where her ancestors are at rest. And she said that um, some of the ancestors uh, were slaughtered during Mary Turner's lynching. She was lynched in 1918. Um, including her unborn child because she um, fought against her husband being lynched. Um, he was accused of killing a white farmer. And so her, she was lynched over a bridge and also her unborn child was, um, was killed as well. And um, she has a lineage of, of, uh, from Mary Turner. So I'm looking forward to talking to her and she wants to talk about her, her brother and her first cousin that escaped the Klan in 1964. 
And so um, the times I've talked to her, she's having a hard time um, reclaiming, reclaiming um, the cemetery for her ancestors because the landowner is not working with her. And so it's been a struggle for her. So I'm looking forward to have her on, um, on March 31st. I'll, I'll be putting a flyer together. So hopefully um, people are able to attend. It's on Friday, uh, the 31st is in the evening. I think that's on a Thursday. So it'll be Thursday evening. And um, once again, thank you all for coming. And like I said, have you checked on your ancestors lately? You all have a good afternoon and talk to you later. James, thank you so much. Everyone that attended, thank you so much for being a part of this. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Be blessed. Thank you.